I guess we should probably address uh, the controversy, the important controversy, which is that I made the greatest mistake I've ever made in the history yes. of this podcast by misattributing the creation, the creator of the thing to to not John Carpenter, but to uh, David Cronenberg. And yes. uh, I will now never stop hearing that for the rest of my life. This is the thing. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I was also going to bring it up that out of all of the things that we've gotten wrong on this show, like we try our best. And when it comes to specifically like science related things, you know, neither of us aren't scientists, right? So we've definitely got some stuff wrong before. However, nothing has made the audience more upset than when you said David Cronenberg's The Thing instead of John Carpenter's The Thing. And you said it so confidently that I just rolled with it. I was like, maybe Tristan's right. I don't think it was. I thought it was John Carpenter, but maybe he's right. Maybe I'm wrong. I think in my mind, I just put all of the body horror directors in like one little cubicle in my uh -huh. head. And I was like, oh yeah, it was Cronenberg. He's the he's a body horror guy. So obviously he did it, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. So we just want you audience to know that we know mm -hmm. our biggest mistake and we promise not to make any more mistakes ever. Yep. And to ensure that, and also as a way of saying penance, uh, we decided to bring back a favorite. Uh, yes. First Achievement Unlocked, first return guest, mm -hmm. um, friend of the pod, and uh, it's probably not Aliens resident biblical scholar, <laughs> Andrew Mark Henry. Thanks for having me. Achievement Unlocked indeed. Second time is a charm. Yeah, and this time you're not in Egypt, so I'm not recording this on 9 a.m. on Sunday, which is yeah, nice. Yeah, and I'm not recording after business hours. So yeah, back back in the US. Very exciting. Yes, I think that was one of the uh one of our very first episodes in fact was was with you on it and that has been uh one of uh, that's been a fan favorite. I got to say, people loved it. People love having you on and hearing your uh expertise especially because it's in a it's you know, it's in an area that as Tristan has alluded, he's not a very um, religious person, and I really only know the stuff that I was taught in, you know, Sunday school. So having someone like yourself who is much more knowledgeable about the history and the culture of of these religious studies is is uh, extremely helpful as we make our pledge to never get anything wrong ever again. Right. Yeah. Well, the the great thing about religious studies is I say this all the time that you don't need to be a Christian or atheist or pagan or whatever to study your religion. It's just an interesting topic in its own right. That that you can approach from any perspective. So, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, so, responding to that flood of comments we got about the thing. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I'm using this one. Um, we're today talking about the flood. You know, you know, all those like, you know, those like um, happy Sunday school pictures of all of the animals two by two going on the ship while yeah. God smilingly commits mass genocide. We're doing that one today. Save some animals. Uh, we, we're going to be doing the one where a person has been cursed for all time because he made fun of his dad for getting drunk and passing out naked. Um, favorite Bible mm. story. Um, <laughs> don't know why they didn't make it into the Russell Crowe movie, but oh well. Uh, <laughs> See, my my go-to reference for the flood for a movie about the the flood would be Evan Almighty, the very much appreciated sequel to Bruce Almighty uh, that everyone loved so much. That was about uh, him building a big boat. We all know that one, yeah. Yeah, why no. we'll say boat. the. The Russell Crowe movie is just one of the biggest missed opportunities. I thought it was terrible, but I'm like, what interesting source material that you could have had, you could have worked with instead it really flopped, like it turned into some weird like swords and sandal battle near the end. And it's like, you know, having a flood, a global destructive flood is interesting enough. You don't need to add a battle. I just remember walking out just feeling like a oh, missed opportunity. Mm -mm. Oh man. So yeah, we're today we're talking about, about um, Noah's flood. And this takes us back to a few episodes that have kind of touched on it. First, uh, when I was in... Uh, uh, a haze of sleep deprivation and um, just I was just up to my arms in dirty diapers and breast milk. Um, you did an episode where you uh, yeah. talked about weather and sure the did. idea of aliens having advanced super weather machines. Yes. Uh, long story short, ancient aliens said that big storms, all big weather events are actually caused by aliens, even in the modern day. So yeah. uh, we took that one and we examined it and, uh, well, you know, this is you can come up to your own conclusion with that one, but uh, I don't know if we were especially convinced. 
Yeah. And so I came through all of those and went on some tangents to realize I, I tried to look at like historical stuff that they then blamed this uh, weather control stuff on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the topic of this and the next episode of this podcast are basically famous historical cases, H historical cases where uh -huh. um, aliens supposedly used their their, uh, you know, Dr. Death's weather machine to uh, to create a flood that will destroy the world. Um, mm -hmm. And this also makes reference to another uh, sort of like side alien UFO era conspiracy where we were talking about with Trey about the Nephilim yes. and about these sort of like angel hybrid people. And we go into another side oh UFO theory when talking about the um, the whole theory that the Anunnaki are here for earth gold, that delicious earth gold. Yeah, they need earth gold specifically. Yeah. Um, so all of these have as part of their mythos the the, the Great Flood, a, a, yeah. a flood that douses the entire world in water. Um, for example, uh, in the Bible, if you take a very literalist idea of the Bible, the Nephilim are the product of angels, angels, or as we call them, celestial beings, i.e. space aliens. Aliens, uh, yeah. Somehow reproducing with humans. Um, don't mm -hmm. talk about genetics here. We don't know how that works, but then creating giants called the Nephilim that God hates so much that he decides to drown the whole world in order to wipe them out. That's sort of the, that's the one argument here. Uh -huh. Um, and then in the Anunnaki story, we have uh, the discussion that for some, the, the Anunnaki had to leave the earth. And the reason why there are no more lizard people telling us what to do and telling us to enslaving us into mining gold. Sure. Uh, is because the, the Great Flood happened. All the all the polar ice caps melted, um, apparently a few thousand years ahead of when they actually are going to melt. And mm -hmm. that flooded the earth. And so they had to leave. And that's why uh, the, the Anunnaki aren't here and they are not coming back until 2012 when the apocalypse apocalypse comes, according to the creator of this. Yeah, the, any minute now they'll be here. They're running a tad late. We need to do an episode this December on the 10th anniversary of the end of the world. Oh, yes. That sounds like a great time. Hey, I'm going to call it really early in the episode. Uh, maybe subscribe to this podcast if you want to hear about more of that later this year. And also, um, so this is It's Probably Not Aliens. <laughs> Oh, yeah. We didn't even introduce ourselves or this show. Why, we're getting worse as this goes on, Tristan. Mm -hmm. um, hi, my name is Scott. I know nothing. I know nothing about anything. I'm here to just sort of listen and learn and ask questions and sometimes make jokes that may or may not be good. And I'm Tristan Johnson. I am rapidly getting myself a seminary school degree in order to do this podcast. And we got Andrew Mark Henry. I'm Andrew Henry. Uh, I am a scholar of religious studies. I focus specifically on late Roman religion specifically demonology and magic. So the weird stuff of antiquity. And I also know a thing or two about biblical studies. So uh, hence, here I am. I cannot wait. I cannot wait until we actually get to do the demons episode and then we can bring you in and we can we can do it. It'll be great. But yeah, so this is a real hodgepodge where basically several ancient, several mutually exclusive ancient alien theories mm -hmm. all hinge on just the accepted fact that a global flood happened. And wh why? Why does this happen? And there is something some interesting things like that there's a strange amount of global flood myths that show up all over the world. Not only places that might have talked to each other like Mesopotamia and the Bible and in Islam and even Hinduism, but there are global flood stories in China. There are global flood stories among the Norse and the Irish, uh, Polynesians, Maya people, uh, the, even the Ojibwe and some South American uh, nations have global flood myths. Uh, even goes as far as Aboriginal tribes in Australia. So this is yeah. a remarkably common meme. And I mean that in the most like academic sense of a meme. Yeah. In the human psyche, um, which I think is very fascinating and interesting mystery to solve. Yeah. Why does it pop up all over the place? That's a big, that's a good question. The answer might not surprise you, but first, why don't we go on a little short tour of how we got to the Bible flood? All right. Are we going on like a, like a 
Gilligan's Island three hour tour? Yes. Um, right. Several thousand years more, but yeah. Um, cool. Because what happens is that the Bible's uh, Genesis's uh, flood story, in many of its key details, is sort of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy from some very, very ancient flood myths that come out of a region called Mesopotamia, which translates to the land between two rivers and uh, is one of the first uh, places. It's considered. It's sometimes called the Cradle of Civilization. That's a bit reductive and a little bit um, Western-centric at this point, but it is one of the first uh, places where we find early human settlements and some of the first cases of human agriculture. So many places in, and this is in modern day Iraq, have had people living there for like actually stunning amounts of time. Like we're talking like mm-hmm. Egypt, like pack your shit. This is like five, six thousand year long societies. <laughs> Wow, like wild amounts of time. Um, so we're going to so the most common, considered like the the preamble or the um, the beginning of what would become the flood myth, goes to um, Gilgamesh. Um, yes. Gilgamesh, a king. Yeah, this is what the, I've heard of this story. And uh, I mean, a- aside from the fact that Gilgamesh was a, one of the main characters in Marvel's Eternals recently, but even before then, this this name rings a bell and this, this story rings a bell in my head. You should, uh, because um, in some places, at least when I took a comic book class a long, long time ago, Gilgamesh was described as the first superhero. Yeah. Oh, that's probably, you know, I I never put that together, but that is almost certainly why Jack Kirby specifically used Gilgamesh in the Eternals uh, for his superhero comic. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it's it's an epic, which is just a series, uh, which is basically just a series of stories featuring one character Mm -hmm. um, trying to, Gilgamesh trying to find and his friend Enkidu trying to discover immortality. And they go on lots of fun adventures trying to do so. Um, The story of Gilgamesh kind of traces its origins to around, and this is how we're talking about how old it is, the 18th century BCE. Okay, um, pretty long ago. Yeah, in and this is this is super petty. In the uh, story, a god by the name of Enlil distra- decides that the world needs to be destroyed because quote humans are too noisy. That checks out to me. I feel that's. I mean, I have I have neighbors who are a little bit too noisy. I can't imagine the sound of the whole earth happening all the time. Always, it's true. I, I actually have the quotation here too, where Enlil says, "The noise of mankind has become too intense for me." With their uproar, I am deprived of sleep. Just trying to get some Z's. So hilariously petty way to destroy the, the universe. See, this is why I love my like uh, bronze. We need we need more of these. Like this is even like this is like almost Neolithic age. Um, like mm-hmm. ancient gods, because uh, you hear this a lot with like the Iron Age Greek mythology stuff too. Like the gods are just insanely petty and are willing to do horrible things to just uh-huh. um, just because they feel like it. Um, so yeah, uh, Enlil thinks that we are terrible roommates on the planet um, sure. and decides to uh, fix it by flooding the whole world uh, like you do. Another entity named Enki warns a hero by the name of Utnampishtim and says that he should build a boat so that life on Earth can survive. And yeah. that 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 feels very that feels very Noah-esque, does it not? Uh, does yeah. Utnampishtim, was he a proto-Noah? Proto-Noah. Yeah, I mean, there are several, it seems like there are several proto noahs as it were so the mesopotamian flood narrative actually stems from three there's like three versions we can speak of so there's one that's a sumerian version then there's two that are akkadian and akkadian is this semitic language uh spoken in babylon and by the assyrians uh so if you've ever seen cuneiform tablets that's akkadian um more often than not so the sumerian flood story it's written on a a tablet that two-thirds of the tablet are missing so we really don't really know the context of the flood story, we're kind of just thrown into the middle of the narrative. But here, the proto-Noah is a king named Zeusudra, uh, and he's called upon to build a boat, save the animals, and the seed of mankind. Uh, and Zeusudra means he of long life. So that's interesting. His name has a specific mm. meaning. Uh, and in another version of this Sumerian version of the story, it's revealed that Zeusudra is both a king and a priest of the Sumerian god Enki. So already we're seeing this idea of a relationship between a boat making guy who saves humanity and you know having a close relationship with one of these big gods. Uh, the other two versions are an old Babylonian version called Atrahasis. Atrahasis is the name of another proto-Noah. Uh, he's 
he's this his name means exceedingly wise uh, mm-hmm. and this probably dates to the 18th century BCE uh, but obviously these Mesopotamian flood stories they stretch back way more than the 18th century so you know the floods flood narratives don't really start popping up until around 2000 BCE at least as we have the evidence um, but we can assume that these stories stretch back further uh, and this is the this is Atrahasis is the hilarious one where Enlil is like hey humanity is too loud I can't sleep and the the real problem is overpopulation. Like for whatever reason, he seems very concerned about mm. human overpopulation. And he tries several times. First, he sends a plague, uh, but the god Aya thwarts it, you know, saves humanity from the plague. Then he tries to send, I forget the second, he tries to send another way to kill them that fails. And then finally he sends a flood, which mostly works, but Atrahasis builds an ark, saves mm. humanity and animals, and him and his family are granted eternal life. So it's like, thank you for saving everybody. You get eternal life, but now now uh, the gods kind of put on strictures to humanity. It's like, now we're going to have infertility and child mortality to help keep population down. Oh, that's um, a bummer. It's kind of a bummer. So it's, it's, it's interesting that at least in the Atrahasis epic, there's like this real concern about uh, overpopulation. And when I think about like somebody writing this in Babylon in 1800 BCE, you can imagine like what urban living would have been like. So I, I'm just thinking like yeah. uh, squalid urban living in 1800 BCE to be <laughs> to underlie the the concerns of this text, but I don't know if I'm off basis on that. Yeah, don't uh, Enlil um, seems like a, uh, a Bill Gates of his time uh, who wants to reduce the human population by a huge amount. That's a bad story. Um, but yeah, this is it's a it's a big it's a big story. It shows up over and over again in Mesopotamia, and as we know, a lot of civilizations surround the sort of Mesopotamian region, and so a lot of further civilizations uh, picked up on it. Uh, one example would be the Satapatha Brahmana, which is fr- uh, the story. It's a story uh, it's very similar, which comes from the Vedas, which are sort of like the holy texts of of Hinduism. Um, this one comes from much much later, like fa- over a thousand years later in the sixth century BC. CE uh, and features uh, Matsya, which is the the fish avatar of Vishnu. Mm. And uh, Vishnu appears to a person named Manu, which in the Vedas is sort of a reference to a generic person. Manu is sort of the the uh, the Sanskrit word for like man or person. Just a guy. Just a little boy. Yeah. yeah. And so Matsya, the, the avatar, uh, warns him of the deluge. And they uh, this this man builds a giant boat. Um, Matsya then grows to a humongous size and guides the ship to safety on the peak of a mountain, which also shows up in the Noah story, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that uh, that's familiar. why they're always looking for the ark on mountains, right? And that uh, they then use the Vedic sacrificial rites to repopulate the earth after the flood or to reestablish life. So there's a lot of like similar beats going on here. And this is a story out of India. So this shows just how it, it traveled a lot. Um, then in Greece, you've got the story of Timaeus. This is in the this is in 360 BCE, and it's a story about how um, humans anger Zeus because and this is this is ironic as hell because Zeus. Uh-huh. Uh, but Zeus gets mad at humans for doing all these wars. They don't like how violent humans are. Uh, so Zeus is like, I'm gonna flood the world. I guess Poseidon was busy. I don't know. Feels like a better person to fit that story, but whatever. Uh, but then. Humanity gets warned by the ever so tricky Titan Prometheus. And uh, after nine days and, uh, and night or after nine days and nights, uh, Timaeus builds an ark, get world saved. Mountain happens all over again. It's all the same. Furthermore, yeah, uh, the sort of descendants of those Mesopotamians, uh, the Zoroastrians, would also have a very similar story, um, which is through the entity named uh, Ahriman, who uses uh, a dragon route to destroy the world instead. Oh, a k- kind of an opposite thing. <laughs> yes. The inverse flood. Yeah. Well, well here, here's the thing, and this is why, this is what's interesting, is because um, Zoroastrianism is very preoccupied with dualism, and so the oh. idea of like an anti-flood actually kind of fits the thing. And it's done, uh, Ahriman is like this Zoroastrian um, like spirit of destruction and evilness, mm-hmm. and consider like basically the main adversary. Like, if I were to say this is like the, the beta concept of Satan uh, wouldn't be the most far off thing because Zoroastrianism um, had there's a lot of fun Zoroastrian clues in the Bible. Um, like, did you know that the Zoroastrians have a, a savior God that represents the sun and has 12 disciples that are represented by the 12 zodiacs or whatever? I'm not sure about that. Maybe there is. But I know that the idea of uh, Satan possibly draws influence from the Zoroastrians. So, you know, the Judahites, the southern kingdom of Judah was taken into uh, exile in into Babylon and then 
then when the Persian Empire takes over, you know, a lot of J- Judahite the- theologians came into contact with Zoroastrian theologians. So later on in Second Temple Judaism, we start seeing uh, the concept of a kind of quintessential evil being named Satan, who's largely absent from the he- Hebrew Bible. You know, there is a Hasatan, the Satan who appears in the book of Job, but he seems more to be like a more ambiguous person. And Hasatan is more of a job title. He's the adversary and the divine counsel of God. So there seems to be some importation of Zoroastrian ideas into Second Temple Judaism. We see this especially in the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Yeah. Um, to kind of finish out the story, so that drought happens, but then Mithra, the, the which is the, the important, uh, wrote very up there God in the Zoroastrian uh, sort of story, okay. um, shoots an arrow into a rock, which somehow creates a flood um, because a spring comes out and basically floods the world. And one man survives building an ark filled with his cattle. So just one animal, just one kind of animal. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's hard to say God. Uh, they were, the, the stuff I looked up said that Mithra is more referred to as a, quote, divinity. Uh, the word is Yazata, which, you know, I don't think has a perfect translation into English. So that's probably mm. why. But, you know, um, so there you go. You have drought followed by flood, followed by uh, the story. So, uh, yeah, Zoroastri- and, and And this makes a lot of sense because basically the Zoroastrians were made up of a lot of the descendants of those ancient Babylonians and Akkadians and, and such. Yeah. Yeah, I always find myself a little... I, I wrestle with this idea of influence across civilization because obviously there's, you know, like Indo-European languages, for example, there's obvious connections stretching across Europe and Asia. Uh, Similar words for like a word for God, you know, Deus, uh, the same word for mother appears in all these different Indo-European languages. So there's definitely like a continuity. But when it comes to like mythological continuity, I find myself skeptical So, because a lot of people would say, oh, well, there's a flood myth in Maya mythology and there's one in Babylonian. Therefore, you know, there must have been a land bridge or something. You know, they find some sort of connection. And I'm like, well, we're talking about, you know, 10th century CE Mexico versus 18th century BCE Babylon. Babylon. You know, I usually say like the idea of dying in a flood is not that unique. You know, humans have been yeah. drowning for as long as humans have existed. So in the same way that like I'm I'm unimpressed by the category mother goddess or father god because like everybody has mo- as a mother or father th- throughout human history so coming mm-hmm. up with a god that is a father is not that unique therefore if it appears in multiple civilizations I I would say we don't see like influence there so whether we're seeing like influence between the civilizations you know maybe but when I'm what I look for is is what we would call intertextual and intertextuality so like similar words that would show somebody was copying a specific copy of a myth. Uh, Mm -hmm. very similar themes where it's just like impossible to deny. Obviously, they were sitting with a copy in front of them. And at least with the Mesopotamian flood flood myths, we definitely see intertextuality. Um, So like Noah sending out birds to check if the floodwaters have receded yet. You know, this is in Mm -hmm. the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the third version I was talking about. We have the Sumerian version, we have Atrahasis, and we have the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, and Utnapishtim in the Epic of Gilgamesh sends out birds to check if the flood waters, waters have receded. I think that the word for pitch or bitumen, like the tar that Noah puts on the ark, both on the inside and outside, that same word appears in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So, so there's like literal intertextuality there. So yeah, Mesopotamian flood myths, 100%, we see influence drawing from the same cultural waters, as it were. Uh, other examples, I'm not sure. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's plausible, but um, it, the connection is more thematic than it is like specific narrative beats that we see borrowed in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, fair. The only ones that I, I give credence to are the ones where um, they're from civilizations that I know had direct linguistic communication. Like like it wouldn't be far it wouldn't be far fetched to say that Mesopotamians and Greeks would have had uh, communication or that Mesopotamians and uh, early like, you know, Indus Valley people would have had those kind of uh, same types of communications. Furthermore, yeah, you kind of hit on the other thing that these could be similar myths. And I I, I, I brought this up later. We could talk about it now, though, um, which is that uh, a lot of what these civilizations have in common, especially the very early ones, is that they all developed on the banks of rivers and rivers have this weird habit yeah. of flooding. Um, so like <laughs> a lot of these uh, really old uh, river valley civilizations 
organizations, um, they we have like archaeological evidence showing that flooding was a very common disaster that befell these people. And so, yeah, especially in Mesopotamia, like southern Mesopotamia was like ridiculously marshy. Um, it still is as far as I know. I don't know if there's been like modern damming. I know the Tigris and Euphrates have less water now with damming up the up the river. But, you know, yeah, the idea of Mesopotamia flooding back then, it just would have been flooding all the time. And actually, one of the narratives comes from the so-called Ark Tablet, which is an old Babylonian tablet discovered by Irving Finkel, who's one of the top Assyriologists. Uh, it's a version of the Atrahasis epic, and it has a it, it describes the type of Ark that Atrahasis built. And he, uh, Ir- Irving Finkel argues that it's describing like a rope and wood uh, circular boat, the type of which that people in Mesopotamia definitely were floating around on. So they're like drawing from a type of boat that like would have been, you know, either used with paddles or poles, uh, mm. you know, very circular. So not really a, a water dynamic uh, uh, vessel, but something that would have been easy to construct out of wood or, uh, uh, you know, plant material that would have been floating around Mesopotamia at the time. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this is why I talked about these ones because they were the most likely to have actual connections. Mm-hmm. But, you know, to see like, oh, a similar story showed up in China. Oh, you mean the country that also was built around like the Yangtze River and um, regularly uses flooding as part of their agricultural practices or... Um, yeah. Or, you know, uh, or the Polynesian people who live on islands that are regularly subject to like typhoons and uh, and storms and such like, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess I just I'm, I'm like adding a dose of skepticism because I know a lot of people want to find what I would call genetic uh, connections, you, you know, like, oh, this person has brown hair. Therefore, they must be the son of Andrew because he has brown hair. I'm like, well, <laughs> <laughs> or we just have brown hair because it's pretty common mm-hmm. versus like doing a DNA study where you're like, oh, there is a genetic connection here. So the DNA in this right. analogy would be using the same word for pitch or using birds, you know, ravens and doves. And then the coincidence would be like, okay, well, floods happen. So I'm always yeah. a little skeptical of just like, you know, claiming genetic uh, lineage in a in a myth, myth when humans are humans and we draw from similar experiences, whether it's having a mother, therefore we should have a mother goddess in a religion or it's, hey, my family died in a flood last year. Let's add to the, <laughs> let's add to the flood myth of our society. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I definitely don't want to... Uh, take any like I, I have a feeling that the tail end of this episode will be more of this discussion of of skepticism and and potentially reasons why there might be connections there but so I don't want to like do all of that up front but just just know, I have some thoughts if we get back to it later as well I just I I don't want to take all the you know have all of this discussion up front potentially uh, depending on where you lead this episode Tristan well our next place that we haven't we've been dancing around but we need to veer in to is everyone's favorite Phil Collins project, Genesis. Everyone's actual favorite is Tarzan, the Tarzan soundtrack, but second gen would be Genesis. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, so where does this flood show up in the Bible? Um, the part that it shows up is in chapters six through nine. Nice. Of the book the of Genesis. Thing. You beat me to it. Uh, both in the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Old Testament. So um, it's, in, it's in both canons. Actually, it's in all three because we'll talk about this in a little bit, but it's also in the Islamic canon. Oh. Um, basically, God is mad at humans, um, mo- like, it, you know, depending upon who your person is because of the Nephilim, because of all of the sinning we're doing, or sure. um, depends upon what your Sunday school teacher wants you to feel bad about it, that you're doing, basically. Mine was that uh, we were disobeying our parents too much. That that's that's what they told us. That's okay. not a joke. That's just what I was actually taught oh. as, a, as a way to get us to listen to our parents more. That's terrifying. <laughs> But yeah, basically God decides that Earth needs to go back to its pre-creation state uh, by using a state of watery chaos and basically just kind of unmake it, um, which, you know, honestly, if I were to look at the world in its state today, I wouldn't be against um, global flood. I, Hmm. I get it. Um, but, and again, it, it has very strong, uh, very strong similarities to the Epic of Gilgamesh, but, um, yeah, like it's, it's a very similar story. Um, got like, uh, Noah gets chosen to be the person to sort of reboot humanity after they do a sort of soft reboot of, of humans. Um, he builds an ark, gets two of each kind of animal. Very important to mention each kind, uh, because, uh, Mm. when you get into young earth creationism, that becomes quite a thing. And 
f- after I believe forty days uh, of, of flooding, forty days, the waters of 40 recede, yeah. and the uh, the ark lands on a mountain. Uh, the waters recede, a rainbow shows up, and God says, yeah. "All right, I promise to never do that again." Um, but be good. Yeah, there are interesting themes to look at here too. So I mentioned earlier. Notice how there's a relationship between the man and the God, and the other versions I mentioned. So the Sumerian version uh, and the Atrahasis. You know, Atrahasis has a relationship with Ea. Um, and in the Atrahasis epic, en- Enlil causes the flood and it's viewed as a wicked thing. You know, the gods are kind of are upset that Enlil did this. And the text explicitly says a wicked deed that Enlil has just done. But Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible is not portrayed wickedly. He's portrayed as just. Like this is something he needs to do because humanity's sin has become so depraved. So the text says that the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I've created. I am sorry that I have made them. So like Oof. they have become oh. so depraved, he regrets it. And so this is why he de- you know, decides to yeah. destroy the earth in a flood. So interesting, like recontextualize, like how it recontextualizes the um, the decision that the God has made. You know, Enlil is doing something yeah. wicked. Yahweh is doing something necessary and just. So that's super interesting. Yeah. Another interesting thing to notice is like the use of water. So in Babylonian creation myth, water, there's like this primordial watery chaos that's kind of that is brought under control in the process of creation. And this is also in the Hebrew Bible. So Genesis 1, 1, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he's, you know, God is floating over this primordial water. Um, and it says that God separates the waters. He puts waters in the deep and he puts waters, you know, in, in the sky, basically, like uh, mm-hmm. above the firmament. And when God causes the flood in the Hebrew Bible, those two storehouses of water are unleashed. So it says water comes up from the deep. And it says that the, I think it uses the word windows, like the windows of the sky are opened and the waters are brought out. Uh, and I think I like thinking of this as like a the sluice gates of a dam. So it's like letting forth this primordial mm-hmm. water that represents chaos to basically recreate Earth. It, it's 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 a yeah. it's a process of recreation, not just destruction. And it's using this this imagery of water that's just str- so strongly evident. And not only the creation myth of Genesis, but in the creation myth of Babylon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, interesting themes going on there. I'd never thought of it that way. Yeah, that's, that's cool. really cool. Um, what I also think is interesting, and I imagine that, Andrew, you'll have probably more to say on this than I can, but also that this is part of a section of the Bible that there's a growing uh, academic consensus might be a lot younger than we thought it was, which is called the the primeval history, um, which is a reference to the first 11 chapters of Genesis, um, which are thought of as a late composition that's, that was attached to sort of make a, an introduction. So, you know, the first 11 chapters of Genesis wrap up like, you know, all the basics of how the world got to the way that it was at the time that it came out. And that um, even though they're sort of supposed to be the oldest stories, they might actually be some of the youngest that were sort of created as a way to make an introduction. Yeah, I'm not up on the most recent scholarship on that. I I would say one of the more mainstream uh, opinions on the composition of the the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, is what's called the so-called documentary hypothesis, which uh, argues that there are several different authors or texts that were kind of brought together by by an editor later on into what we have today. And they try to identify them uh, by by letters. You have the, the P source, uh, the I think the J source. So I'm, I'm actually not fully up on the documentary hypothesis as a non-Hebrew Bible expert. Um, but they they have different themes, different uh, concerns. So the P stands for priestly source. So this is like the book of Leviticus that seems so concerned with how the priest should act, uh, you know, cult practice for the cult of Yahweh. Um, so in terms of, you know, when the first 11 chapters date to, I'm, I personally don't know. But generally speaking, the Pentateuch, as we know it, was brought together much later than what we usually assume. So at least the sixth century, possibly even later, like the fifth century BCE, um, you know, there's, there's one idea idea that, you know, when the, the kingdom of Judah was brought into exile into Babylon, this is when they would have uh, started seeing more connections between the Babylonian creation myth and their own creation myth. And it got like, you know, renewed interest in it, even if it dates back further. Um, but yeah, we're dealing with, you know, the Atrahasis epic, 18th century BCE. This is before the people of Israel even existed. Uh, the earliest archaeological mention we have of the Israelites is like 1300 BCE. Uh, and the actual Genesis text itself is much later. So 6th century 
century uh, or later. Um, generally speaking, thought of to come, you know, have been compiled under King Josiah, who was ruling during the 600s, I believe. Yeah. Uh, some of the evidence they use to make that argument is that these uh, opening chapters have uh, some sort of introductions of uh, myths from surrounding civilizations like Mesopotamians and even one Egyptian story that mm. um, that's including the Great Flood as part of it. You know, you've got you got the Adam and Eve, you got the first murder um, with uh, what's it called? Uh, Cain and Abel, Cain Big and Abel. Rock. Yeah. How, how, how move Big Rock? Kill brother. Um, <laughs> And yeah, then you've got, yeah, the destruction of the world um, and the new humanity that goes through. And the, and then history ends with the Terra, the father of Abraham. And Abraham is sort of the the, the opening act, I guess, mm -hmm. as the sort of beginning of, you know, the, the beginning of is of the Israel of Israel and uh, the um, in Judea and everything like that. Yeah, I just this is only tangentially related, but I just want to throw this out there into the world. Um, I would love like a true crime podcast uh, or mockumentary sort of thing about Cain and Abel. Like that would be very funny to me to 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 take it very take that whole story very seriously uh, in in the modern like uh, stylings of like a true crime podcast, but just in this it, just about the story of those two. I don't know why. I just think that would be fun. Wanted to throw that out into the world to see if anyone wants to make that for me. Thank you. The Cain and Abel documentary. It's like mm -hmm. kind of like a, I, I can almost see it like a like a serial. Yeah, uh, just serial, serial true crime but... podcast, but like where they're going through all the um, the possible like all of the possible suspects. But there's like only like five or six people on Earth. Yeah, so there's it's not like... very many. Is where is he? They, you know, he says he's missing. Where is he at then? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing too that kind of shows this like multiple authors thing is that there's a lot of strange details in the flood story. There's there's actually like contradictory details in the text. Mm -hmm. uh, details like uh, how many animals are on the ark and how long the flood lasted are different in different places. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and so this this happened and it's been interpreted by different religious traditions. Uh, Christians refer to the flood as a symbol of the uh, as sort of like a, a proto version of the the savior, the sa the salvation of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the whole like God, God did the bad thing and now now he loves you um, and that shows it that from that point on now he loves you um, maybe that's the point where God goes from wrathful and angry to the one that is you know the one of like more Christian myth and then also in in the in the Quran um, mm -hmm. the the figure Na um, has a story very uh, has a very similar story to Noah and except that he preaches Islam so yeah um, that's like the general idea of the yeah. of the flood so it's it's popped up all over the place it's uh, in all sorts of different, uh, you know, periods of time, all sorts of different cultures and civilizations, it's all over the place. So obviously the big, the big question then is like, is, was it real? Was there really a, a global flood? Yeah. What's the story here? How, how do we understand what was happening? Well, was there a great flood, Scott? And yeah. Andrew, the answer will come right after oh, no. these messages. Oh, all right. See you in a bit. And we're back. How do we, how do we think we're doing so far on our new pledge to not get anything wrong? Yeah, Andrew, how how perfect am I nailing this? I know there's uh, a couple times where you like swooped in and be like, before you make any mistakes, I'm just gonna <laughs> gently explain this. No, I think we're doing pretty good so far. Yeah. Okay. Again, a little bit outside my, outside my wheelhouse, but as far as I understand, Mesopotamian creation or uh, flood narratives, I think I think we're doing good. Awesome. All right. Sweet. I That's like good. when I'm I'm not wrong. And um, just a, just a quick uh, recap: Who did the thing movie? Who did the thing movie? Tristan, who did the movie um, The Thing? John Carpenter, right? You got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, wasn't there a remake? Th that was the I thought. Anyway, I don't. Care. It's the original. Okay, never mind. It doesn't um, matter. We can't be wrong anymore. Let's. We're gonna edit all yeah, this out. Yes, we have to be completely infallible. Uh huh. Um, but yeah. So um, here's the general consensus, and I'm sure that this will surprise you immensely. 
intensely, which is that a global flood, as described in these various myths, is, quote unquote, inconsistent with the physical findings of geology, paleontology, and the global distribution of species. Okay, so that sounds... But... Yeah. Here's what's interesting, and that is that Noah's flood and this whole story was kind of key to a very specific time in our history, in the history of science, and that uh, our understanding of the flood's role in history might have been like one of the first big cracks that led to the um, shattering of the common belief in biblical literalism. Okay, I'm intrigued. Continue. Sure. So as, as recently as the 19th century, it was general consensus that the flood happened, literally. Yeah. Bible says it. It's good. That's it's as far as you need to know. They uh, wrote it down. We, 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 we're doing good. But then pesky scientists start showing up and digging in the rocks. I hate when that happens. And unfortunately, when they dig in the rocks, they find interesting stuff like sediment layers sure. and, 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 and fossils mm-hmm. and realize that um, I don't remember the Bible saying anything about dinosaurs. That's big one. Yeah. So there so there was this weird period in the 19th century where geologists were really starting to come into their own as a scientific um, endeavor. Mm-hmm. And there was this equally strong movement. Well, I don't know about equally strong, but there was a very pronounced uh, movement of theologists working with some sort of rogue geologists trying to reinterpret everything that was being discovered by the geologists in order mm. to reaffirm that the flood definitely happened, guys. Gotcha. I will say I was taught once again in Sunday school, I will just keep bringing up my memories of that, that the answer to the Bible not mentioning dinosaurs is that the Bible also does not mention giraffes. Um, but giraffes are prob- uh, giraffes are also real and were probably around at the time. And so potentially, you know, people at the Bible times were just seeing dinosaurs all over the place and it wasn't a big deal. And they didn't write about it because it was like, yeah, this is what happens. These I mean, are dinosaurs. You say giraffes are real. I'm skeptical. I don't yeah. know if an animal with a neck that long is real. I think another argument brought out is that the book of Job mentions something called the behemoth and the leviathan. So yeah. These two mythical beasts, as it were. Uh, and I've heard it argued, oh, one of those is like a sauropod, like a like a apatosaurus. Mm. And the leviathan is obviously referring to a, you know, a T-Rex or something like that. Yeah. So we they were at least two dinosaurs. They were at all, least two. Yeah, it was like Flintstones. They were just like, dinosaurs are all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if you were to go into, we'll get into uh, young earth creationism, but that is generally the belief. Um, but basically what the attempt to uh, fight against the growing consensus in geology came up against was basically just pointing at cases of glacial sediment where a lot of rock had been moved in relatively recent times because of the growing and I mean in in a geological sense very recent because a lot of stone got flattened by um, glaciers growing over them and then retreating as the ice age ended mm-hmm. um, and then pointing at that and showing that as a sign of flood. Um, um, but uh, and that's why. But but then in 1862, the really big breakthrough happened where a uh, geologist by the name of William Thompson uh, speculated that the date of the Earth was probably between uh, 24 to 400 million years old, I, which is way younger than it is, as, but it's still way older than what people thought it was. As a point of clarification, and this is a silly question, but as a point of clarification, when you say between 24 to 400 million years old, that 24 also refers to million years old, right? Yes. It's not like it's between 24 years old and 400 million years old, right? Yeah. Okay. I just, silly question. You could start your own argument and be like, I am the young, young earth creationist. I'm the, the extremely only, young. <laughs> it wasn't around until I was here. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned. That's the solipsistic uh, young earth creation. Creationism, but the earth was created just when you were born. There you go. Um, but yeah, like I really want to put your your mind in the head of the people of this time. Think about this. You grow up in a, a Christian, in a, in a you know Western Christian society. You are taught that the Bible is pretty much a documentation of history, that yes. the earth, uh, that we have like, you know, that some scholars, biblical scholars have looked at the Bible and they estimate that uh, the world's probably about 6,000 years old. Um, you know, that, that makes sense following everything. Then people start start finding very the bones of very large animals and scientists start saying that the earth is not only much older than or not only older than 6000 years old but is millions of years old incomprehensible mm. amounts of history and and time have have passed on this earth and when you have like a you know a, a, a religious worldview how significant that could be 
And so in some ways, it's uh, it's um, I, I can kind of empathize with the people who then went out of their way to try and fight back against this growing consensus, to sort of cling on to a past um, that that made more sense to them. You kind of this is kind of the same uh, urge you see in the growing flat earth movement today. You know, people who uh, don't like this growing scientific understanding of the world and want to go back to something that was simpler and better to understand. I mean, yeah, it, it does. It definitely feels like, uh, I don't know. It, I guess my problem is if the earth was flat and you built a boat to save the humans in a flood, then you would for sure fall off of it, right? As far as I know, that is the, that is the case, yes. Okay, so I don't know if those are extremely compatible. They're playing Valheim, yeah. a game where you actually can sail off the edge of the world. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, the other issue that came up, and not just geology, but in um, the study of, species distribution. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a bit older, which is that uh, we had this idea that, you know, we knew all the animals, all the kinds, everything was, you know, connected, all came from Noah's flood. It was perfect. It was great. We did it. Nailed it in one. Then we found out that the Americas existed, Mm -hmm. an entire set of continents that had no connection to uh, the old world for thousands of years, that had a completely, uh, had a a group of, uh, had people on it that had developed a completely parallel set of cultures and an entire different ecosystem made up of very different plants and animals. And if all the plants and animals can at some point name themselves or drift themselves all the way back to, you know, Mount Ariat or whatever, uh, where the, where the Ark landed, Mm -hmm. then like, why does, why does, why does this continent have potatoes and tomatoes and chipotle peppers and um, yeah. all the other essentials, peanuts and, um, you know, all of those. Yeah. It's like earth DLC just dropped totally new game. Yeah. And also that there's, there's all these humans here. And so for a long time, the consensus was that they were one, and this is their, this was their typical go-to when there was people that they couldn't explain that it was a lost tribe of Israel. Um, yeah. I don't exactly know the lost tribes of Israel story. Uh, maybe Andrew, you got that one. Oh man. Yeah. This is a deep one. So according to the Hebrew Bible, the Israelites were divided into 12 tribes, you know, most famously Judah, tribe of Benjamin, uh, and they kind of get these parcel of land, parcels of land all throughout the region from stretching from the Negev Desert or the Dead Sea all the way up to what's now like the modern day border between uh, Israel and Lebanon. Uh, and according to First and Second Kings in the Hebrew Bible, the Assyrian Empire comes through and decimates the kingdom of Israel. So there's these two kingdoms, Israel, Judah. Judah is centered around Jerusalem. Israel is centered around the city of Samaria, which is mostly uh, what's now the Palestinian territory of the West Bank and just carries off the entire Northern Kingdom. So that's 10 of the 12 tribes. And so ever since then, there's just been, you know, constant speculation about what happened to these 10 tribes and just constant new religious movements popping up, claiming we we are descendants of those 10 tribes. Uh, so, you know, all, almost all of these are spurious. And even, you know, scholars today argue there were actually not 12 tribes. This is just an invention in the Hebrew Bible. So it, it gets pretty complicated if we dig too deep into it. But uh, it's, it is one of the long and during uh, new, you know, inspirations for new new religious movements uh, to claim lineage with one of the 10 tribes. Yeah, I learned all about this in the dramatization of what I'm going to call Beta Jesus um, hmm. in the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, where you can learn about the progenitor of all of those tribes um, done and to what, music. What, what's actually interesting is like, as far as we can tell from the archaeology, like the, the land was not completely depopulated by the Assyrians. Like they must have took, taken off at least the elites or some, you know, some percentage of the population, but some percentage stayed behind. And there's a religious group today called the Samaritan Israelites who probably descend from those people in that area. So like even, even this idea of the lost 10 tribes, I'm like, well, they're not completely lost because there's these Samaritan Israelites. It's a religious group of like 1000 people. It's it's very small uh, that has this long roots around that ancient region of Samaria. Mm -hmm. So the consensus quickly became uh, in Europe that obviously 
obviously the Native Americans were the descendants of one of these lost tribes and that they brought whatever animals and plants they wanted with them to the Americas. And they're the ones who seeded it with all of its flora and fauna. Um, then in 1646, a guy by the name of Thomas Brown wondered some questions about, um, about the decisions that these people made, because why would a lost tribe of Israel come to the Americas with rattlesnakes, hmm. but not with horses? Um, hmm. Snakes and, are cool. Snakes and are cooler. That's all yeah. it is. Snakes are cooler. <laughs> So the, the, there's a real crisis. Like, why did they bring all of, like, why did the animals that were brought, they weren't very useful or they or they were very different? And then why were there some that were completely unique? What's going mm. on? So they then um, had a kind of like a scientific revolution about where animals and plants come from. And they came to a brand new forward thinking progressive solution, which was that um, animals and plants just kind of appear out of nothing occasionally. Oh. Uh, this was called the theory of spontaneous generation. Um, and if you think about things from a pre-scientific or at least without um, the ideas of biology we have today, there's some ways this makes sense. If you see, if you leave a piece of meat out to rot, eventually maggots will start showing up. And if you didn't know better, you would think that it's possible that maggots are made from meat. It just happens that that's how it works. Yeah, they just and, can. Yeah, I and get so it. That un yeah, under certain conditions, different animals and plants will just spontaneously generate. Uh, fleas could come. Fleas came from dust, as an example. Ah. And so that this was a common, regular occurrence that living matter just comes from non-living matter. That's I've never heard of that, but that's so interesting to me <laughs> to think about. <laughs> So, yeah, there's this, there's this change happening in the early modern period. Mm -hmm. And biblical scholars at this time, uh, the two examples that I came across are a guy named uh, Justus Lipsius and another guy named uh, Athanasius Kircher. Okay. They um, started to look at the Ark story and tried to apply, and because of these uh, this, this new kind of revelations about species distribution and stuff like that, started to look at it in a little bit more of a skeptical way. They were trying to harmonize the, the accounts that it, of, uh, of the flood in the Bible with the growing body of knowledge about history and uh, basically of natural history. Um, and yet, uh, this would basically begin the field of what's called uh, biogeography. This this uh, this would this was like the beginning of that of this this discipline studying what would eventually become like things like paleontology and um, and mm. like uh, geology and stuff like that. Wild. Yeah, and the problem never got easier because everywhere humans went, kept finding more species. Uh, it turns out that. Uh, we are just infinite varieties of infinite animals and infinite plants and infinite. Uh, I mean, they didn't know about bacterium and stuff like that, but that would have or, or Australia for that matter. So like <laughs> that would have shown that like biology can go all sorts of different places. And this starts to make uh, the idea that every single animal traces its origins to one boat very much uh -huh. more complicated. That boat keeps getting bigger every day. <laughs> I will say I don't super love use like the the seeming almost uh, equating, they didn't know about bacteria, nor did they know about Australia. Like it, it almost feels insulting to Australians. Uh, no, it's just like <laughs> no, Australia. Like uh, biologically, Australia is very interesting because it was so isolated it, for so yeah, long that it has a sure. very unique uh, for like, sure. Nature. I'm just saying. I'm sorry, Dale. Sounds... I, I'm just making more mistakes, <laughs> even when you're not here. Uh, yeah. No, you're all good. So this started to change things, and um, these early natural historians uh, were trying to um, they're, they're they're trying to figure out what the problem was. Uh, as more species were being discovered, we were trying to figure out how do they all fit on an ark. Uh, and this sort of changed the way that mm. a lot of biblical scholars and these, these these sort of natural historians started to look at the story. And so by the time you got to the mid 18th century or so, a lot of these burgeoning natural historians were pretty much done with the idea of a literal interpretation of the biblical flood. Mm. Um, the, the data was just not adding up. It was too tricky to put together. Yeah, it seems like it'd, it'd have to be a, quite a bit, a, a very big boat, a very big boat. Mm. Mm -hmm. to fit all the animals on it. Yeah. Um, so in conclusion, there was probably not a flood. No flood means no aliens making a flood. Mm. So that's where we're at. But okay. why so many floods? Why does this yeah. show up over and over again in different civilizations? Some that have very tenuous, if not zero contact with each other? Yeah. 
Um, we kind of touched on this earlier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Many societies began life close to rivers. Uh-huh. Uh, and I don't know if you guys know anything about biology, but um, I've heard water is very good for, for life in general. Pretty and good. so we have developed our civilizations next to water for basically as long as we've had civilizations. Yeah, I'm and a fan. when you live next to bodies of water, f- as somebody who lives like two blocks from a river, I know uh, floods are a thing. Mm-hmm. It's a thing that happens. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, like that's as Andrew, you basically said that floods are a general, generally accepted part of everyday life in any civilization that lives next to water. And before, you know, before uh, we really started to tap into different types of water supplies and, you know, building aqueducts and stuff like that, most sufficiently large cities and civilizations had to be close to a water source. Um, yeah. And I, I want to be clear that I'm saying like in general, floods could have inspired these myths because there is there is like a subset of people that argue, oh, well, these myths were not inspired by a literal global flood. They were inspired by a local flood, you know, something that mm-hmm. was so big and catastrophic catastrophic that it, it inspired them to write this down which i guess is plausible but like in the grand scheme of myths they don't always need to tie back to a historical trigger mm-hmm. if that makes sense like the or or could have been added to by subsequent floods like we're talking thousands of years right lots of floods can happen in those times yeah mm-hmm. exactly so like i guess we could say it's plausible you know there's i've even seen an argument that you know geologically speaking the black sea might have expanded drastically in a short amount of time Time, millions of years ago. And some will say, oh, well, the, the expansion of the Black Sea is what inspired the earliest flood narrative because they just experienced the Black Sea just flowing over its banks. I'm like, maybe, but like, it doesn't need to be. The, there's there's like this knee-jerk reaction to have some sort of rationalistic explanation for mythology when I, yeah. I just don't see a need. And when you when you look at myths worldwide, like they, they don't all tie back to like a historical trigger. Many do. Um, but it's not a necessary prereq, prereq to a, to a myth. Yeah. And, th- and I was going to build off of that too, because th- this is what I was going to mention earlier. And I think you s- set it up perfectly here. Uh, my under, my thought, my kind of observation, and you, you can tell me if I'm off base here, but it feels to me that focusing so much on one potential sort of shared myth of, of a flood between all these different uh, cultures, uh, like it seems significant, but you're also like throwing out all of the other myths that are not shared. And so like, it just feels like out of all of them to find one that seems like it's, it's shared. I don't know. It feels very like cherry picking the, like by like a rule of numbers, they have to like, at some point you're going to find some similarities between, yeah. between something. If I mean, you're throwing everything else out people are just so obsessed with finding origins and i don't blame them Mm -hmm. like i'm interested in orange origins too but to posit that and oranges too Mm -hmm. but like the origins of the you know the first flood myth this was the first flood myth i just don't think really exists there's probably someone you know one small town had a myth about a flood another small town had a myth about a flood and then it just starts accreting and you know snow snowballing into this more the atrahasis myth or the utnapishtim myth um i again we'll use the analogy of language where like who was the first person to say a word that ended up in the Indo-European languages? Like there's probably mm-hmm. no single moment where that happened because cultural change is just so messy and happens so slowly and in different ways in different places. So this this obsession with finding the the original local flood that inspired the mythology I think is a a wild goose chase, even though I would say that's interesting. Like if it does stretch back to like the flooding of the Black Sea, then sure, that's awesome. Like I, I would love love that to be true. I just find myself extremely skeptical about finding the original uh, inspiration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And like this comes up in Ancient Aliens a lot too, because they do this conflation of different stories that have similar elements just because humans live in similar environments mm-hmm. and use that to draw these connections that aren't there. How many, how many civilizations now have we had to essentially try to explain very kindly to the ancient aliens people that all civilizations have a sky and see stars and so they develop stories about yeah. stars. I mean, like, yeah, we, we even <sighs> talked about in the Ark of the Covenant episode where ancient aliens, theor- ancient astronaut theorists might, like some of them believe that the Ark of the Covenant is in Japan just because there's a, a religion in Japan that has something similar to an Ark of the Covenant and 
uh, that they carry up a mountain. And it's just, it's so reductive in that sense to be like, this thing looks like this other thing. So they're definitely related. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, this is a very detailed version of thing looks like a thing. Yeah. Um, but I gotta say that this story about, you know, like generally today, the general acceptance is that the biblical, literal global flood didn't happen. It's not a thing. It's, it's a, it's a not fact. It is factant. Um, <laughs> but of course this wouldn't be a podcast that has a significant section where I make you sad if it didn't have a section that made you sad. And that is that is the flood gonna happen. There is still some people who are trying to keep this, keep this like the people who tried to fight the growing field of geology in order to prove that the flood happened by pointing mm -hmm. at glacial settlement patterns and saying that must have been the flood. Uh -huh. There are still people trying to make the case for a global flood in the days where ground penetrating radar exists. Mm -hmm. um, in the 20th century, there have been a group uh, of young earth creationists that have tried to revive flood geology, as it's called. Okay. as part of their overall growing um, movement to try and oppose the theory of evolution. <laughs> Um, ah. They are trying to recreate uh, scientifically, scientifically mm -hmm. through cherry picking and all sorts of like extremely to logic, trying to go back to an idea that the earth was literally made in six days, that it is literally 6,000 years old, and that a flood literally did happen, and that any sign in the past of any cataclysmic geological event is evidence of that. And, um, and that it has created this small parallel uh, idea of all of these, you know, very well developed fields of study, but with the very, very different conclusion that it flies in the face of a lot of evidence. Um, so, so that's fun. Um, Great. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I had the stats with me. I'm pretty sure a huge percentage of American Christians are young Earth creationists, and it, it's, it seems to be a specifically evangelical phenomenon. Um, and it seems to be an American phenomenon. Like you'll meet evangelicals from Canada and the UK who are not nearly as young Earth creationists as American evangelicals. So mm -hmm. again, I'm, I'm kind of outside my wheelhouse. I'd love to sit down with a scholar of American religion to confirm this, but it seems to be kind of this American evangelical Christian thing. And as far as I know, it's a very much, it's very much a reactionary movement from the 19th and 20th centuries in mm -hmm. reaction to the growing of Darwinian evolution, the growing of biblical criticism. So the 1800s, and the early uh, 20, uh, 1900s was a time of growing scholarship on the Bible. So this is when the documentary hypothesis was first hypothesized. Like, oh, the Pentateuch was not written by Moses. It was written by multiple different sources that were cobbled together. Um, oh, the Apostle Paul did not write all of the letters that say the Apostle Paul wrote them. And this was the early era of biblical archaeology. So explorers were going up and down the Levant, discovering archaeological sites that refer that are re referred to the Bible, but also seem to refute things that are in the Bible. Like the, the invasion of Joshua into the, the Holy Land doesn't seem to have happened. So the whole fundamentalist movement, uh, fundamentalist movement in the United States in particular, seems to be a backlash to those yeah. uh, those growths in scholarship, both for biblical scholars and for you know scholars of biology and and uh, zoology stuff like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and again, I, I'm I can only speak from my own uh, experience growing up very religious, but like this is this is the sort of stuff that I was taught uh, growing up was specifically as a reaction to, you know, scientific and, and historic advancements and, and trying to uh, piece together a lot more history of the world. And like, I remember very specifically having lessons about trying to refute a lot of these new findings and uh, as as like a reaction to, to everything that was going on. So like this is, it, it just, it, it hits home for me a little bit being like, yeah, I, it makes sense. Like I was, I was being raised under exactly that and so it's I don't know it's it's interesting to to sort of see in a in a grander scale what's uh you know what you know the timeline of all these events happening and seeing that I was at least living through a, a part of it as I was being mm -hmm. you know, raised yeah yeah flood ge flood geology specifically the the effort to still keep the torch uh burning trying to prove that the global flood happened was uh primarily a movement within the Seventh-day Adventist church which is a uh church I think was pretty well known for being pretty hardcore 
Um, and then there was, then uh, a book was published in 1961 called The Genesis Flood. And ever since then, the 1970s, um, ha uh, proponents have built on this and it has become its own sort of parallel scientific endeavor, uh, otherwise known as scientific creationism or creation mm -hmm. science, which are probably more common terms that uh, American listeners would probably be familiar with. Yes. Um, which like, for the record, as a non-American, um, the, the, young, the young earth creationism stuff, whenever I hear about it, is like, that's the most like, that is like one of the weirdest things where like, again, like like a huge percentage of American Christians believing that the earth is 6,000 years old yeah. is wild to me. Um, because even like, even Christians here are are not, like that's not a thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which going back to what I said, like you'll, you'll have evangelicals from the United Kingdom or evangelicals from Canada attending the same conferences. And even though they share so much theology, like they are both evangelicals, they say, sing the same worship songs in their church services. They believe the same thing about Jesus's death and resurrection. They don't believe the same thing when it comes to the age of the earth. So I don't know what it is, whether it's the, the history of that fundamentalist backlash in the 20th century, but mm -hmm. something about uh, American evangelicalism really has found fertile ground for young earth creationism to grow. This, this, this is like scratching. I'm like scratching at like a packed in piece of rubble in my brain that wants to do a video on American evangelicalism on step back. And now it's like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to do this. I'm going to have to make this at some point. But yeah, um, so if you are a young earth creationism creationist, uh, I'm sure, and you're still listening to this podcast, like good on you. Yeah. Wow. Um, thank you. So I will say that a lot of this stuff, like, like flood geology, it does contradict the scientific consensus in the field of geology, stratigraphy, geophysics, physics in general, paleontology, biology, anthropology, and archaeology. Um, I always point out that in in, uh, in this stuff that um, if young earth creationists are um, literally correct, that there are living trees that are older than the earth. Um, and that and that light from stars that had to have been created mid motion heading towards earth from its destined star. Mm. Um, but the thing is, and I don't know if any of us is going to be able to convince you because neither none of us, I think, are identified strong Christians at this point, but uh, that you don't, and I, I try to say this off as possible because we try to not be mean to religious people. I understand Absolutely. religion has a very profound and very valuable and good part of people's lives, but 100%. it doesn't, these, these stories don't need to be literal for them to have meaning. And that people have, there are people who are very devout, evangelical Christians even, as as you were saying about, um, about evangelicals outside of the US that have, that dedicate their entire lives to a very fervent and ecstatic belief in their faith that doesn't require stretching your brain beyond recognition to force these Iron Age stories to fit the scientific understanding of the world. I hope that does that make sense. Do we have any? Do we have any? Do you have any wisdom? You must. You yeah. must. Uh, you must have like your fair share of young earth creationists who show up on religion for breakfast. What do you? How do you have conversations with them? For sure. Yeah, I usually point to the complexity of their own tradition. So you know, we can just just with evangelicalism, you can find evangelicals that are not young earth creationists. So. You have evangelical institutions like Liberty University, which, as far as I know, is young earth creationist, teaches young earth creationism in their biology classroom. But then you have evangelical or evangelical majority uh, institutions like Wheaton College, where Billy Graham went or Messiah College, which are evangelical overwhelmingly, but also teach actual science in their classrooms. So. So like even within your own tradition, if you happen to be an American evangelical that believes in young earth, young earth creationism, you can find people that are within your tradition who can kind of convince you otherwise, if that is. Because I, I think of it in terms of like a spectrum, like you're never going to be convinced by an out and out atheist if you are a, you know, full on young earth creationist. Like there's too too much of a gulf between each other. Uh, like the debate that Bill Nye the Science Guy had with Ken Ham, who's a famous young earth creationist that happened a few years ago. Yeah, I, I just don't think that's very effective because people in the audience, the evangelicals in the audience are not going to not going to view Bill Nye, the science guy as a credible source because they're acculturated to be distrustful. So I'm like, OK, so if you're not going to trust him, would you trust a Christian uh, professor at Wheaton College, you know, one of the bastions of evangelical thought, because that professor believes in an old earth and might have even done like geological surveys in Australia or something and found the oldest rock that dates to four billion years old. Like, 
maybe taking their class could help you. Um, it's because too often this devolves into like atheist versus Christian on on YouTube. And I'd rather see, you know, Christians that also happen to be scholars who could help, you know, a young earth creationist see the what I consider what's much more interesting, which is the vast depth of time that the universe is. Like it's so much older, which makes it so much weirder and interesting in my opinion. Yeah. Now it is currently lunchtime, but if say tomorrow morning, I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to have cereal for breakfast. I think I'm going to have religion for breakfast. Uh, where would I go to find you talking very uh, eloquently and intelligently about the things that you are more versed in? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So I'm mainly a YouTuber. You can go to youtube.com slash religion for breakfast. Uh, I like to think of it as the one-stop shop for world religions. So if you want to learn about Islam or Buddhism or Christianity or ancient Egyptian religion or even more, you know, thematic topics like religion and politics or religion and the environment. Like head on over to Religion for Breakfast on YouTube. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram at Andrew Mark Henry. So if you want to keep up with me there, I'm also there. His stuff is very good and gets the uh, yes. ultimate thumbs up from my mom, who's a big fan yes. and always awesome. wants me. Well, always, every time I see her or every once in a while, she'll ask me if I've talked to you recently and if, if I'm <laughs> how you're doing. <laughs> and what your content's like. Yeah, and I guess I should say, like, I I come from the position of religious studies, which is the secular study of religion. We study religion as an aspect of human culture using the tools of history and anthropology and sociology and archaeology. So we're decidedly not a theological channel or what I would call a devotional channel. It's all about studying religion as as a thing that humans do uh, without affirming or disaffirming the ultimate truth about the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Absolutely. Now, if you liked this podcast, Podcast, and you want to listen to me say that I thought that David Cronenberg made the thing, mm -hmm. uh, you should listen to, uh, you should uh, follow this podcast. And yes, to find out what's going on with us, you can go to our Twitter, which is at Props Not Aliens. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, we also have our own YouTube channels if you want to hear us talk about things largely not related to this podcast podcast i can say that for me but tristan what about you i do i do stuff that's if you like the section where tristan makes you sad you'll love my channel but mm -hmm. i do it about other things this is me um branching out and doing something that's a little bit more fun because my channel's a little grim i'm currently like elbows deep in a video on the oklahoma city bombing and so i'm just like i just need to All talk right. about big flood for a little bit <laughs> talk about some aliens yeah and that channel's called uh step back which you can find at stepbackhistory.com fantastic uh and then me. I have a YouTube channel. It's called NerdSync. N-E-R-D-S-Y-N-C. I make video essays about uh, really anything that I'm interested in, largely comic books and superheroes and uh, cartoons, all that good stuff. I've got a, a whole bunch of fun videos coming up. One of them is just a rant about Amazon, so like the company Amazon. So have look forward to that. Uh, thank you to uh, people who wrote reviews. I want to specifically shout out uh, because iTunes, I didn't realize only shows us the American reviews unless I specifically request otherwise. So just for you, Tristan, I want to thank our Canadian uh, listeners who wrote in reviews. Thank you to Sam Hanian. Thank you to Slamit99, that guy blank and regular man 987. Thank you to all of you for writing reviews uh, on Apple Podcasts. Uh, it's a fantastic way to show support for this show as well as telling your friends. Tell your yep. friends to listen to this show. Uh, Podcasts don't have recommendation algorithms. So just keep uh, telling people. Really, about word of mouth it. is the only way that we grow. And the best, you can just send them to probsnotaliens.com. It's got all of the links to listen anywhere. Uh, thank you so much again to Andrew Mark Henry for being here uh, and making us sound smart uh, and making sure that everything we said was correct and 100% accurate. If really anything is incorrect, it. you can email Andrew Mark Henry. At Can't blame me. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you should subscribe to Religion for Breakfast. It's yes. genuinely like one of my favorite YouTube channels. Um, so on that note, we are off. But... The truth is out there. Probably. That was good. 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 That was good.
That was good.